<laughs> you know, we have, a, uh, we have a tradition around here that some of you <laughs> may not be familiar with, but it's called, How About Them Claymores? <laughs> Gets pressure, gets rid of it. Looks Got for it. La Chapelle, touchdown Scotland. La Chapelle in motion to give to Stacy. Touchdown, Claymore. Matthews. Touchdown. Scott Cooper again. Goes upstairs, looks, touchdown Scotland, what a big play to Sean LaChapelle. Matthews looks, goes over the middle, got a man, touchdown Scotland! Tips up, picked off. George Coghill's got it and could be gone. Touchdown, Scotland. He's got all kinds of blocking. He's got 20 to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown. Stacy. Oh, that's oh, great. Oh. Moves up nicely to avoid the rush. He's looking deep down the field. Oh, nice catch. And Beautiful touchdown. Catch. Ballard drops the pass. Looks in the direction of Yo Murphy. Got it. Touchdown, Scotland. Ballard looks for Murphy. Yes, oh, touchdown. What a, what a catch. Ballard goes upstairs. Has a man. Has a first down. In 1995, the Scottish Claymores finished their inaugural season at the bottom of the World League. Two wins, eight losses, no victories at home. But they attracted an extremely loyal home support. And at season's end, head coach Jim Kreiner made a forthright prediction. You know, if they will give us the same loyalty and support that they did last year, if they'll bring one or two people with them to the ball games and continue to cheer like they have, we'll give them wins. We'll give them what they're looking for and what they deserve because there's no reason why the Scottish Claymores can't be champions of the World League in 1996. The Claymores organization regrouped for the 96 campaign, and new general manager Mike Keller knew exactly what needed to be done starting in the front office. Well, having worked with Jim before and having been in the football business myself for a long time, I knew that the primary job that I had was to try to remove the distractions and the hurdles that a team has that prevents it from uh, doing the job that they have to do on the field. So what we came in to do was to pr provide for better housing, better food, uh, steady uh, payments to the players, all the little things that you would take for granted that seemed to be screwed up in 1995 for many of the World League teams. So what we did was try to remove the distractions and allow them to concentrate. And then the chemistry of the team took over and the quality of the player that Jim was able to assemble and the results were on the field. If the Claymores were to entice more people to come out to the games in 96, they needed a place where folks could find out about their new national gridiron team. 137 George Street in Edinburgh became a Claymore's ticketing and merchandising outlet. A welcoming atmosphere and a large selection of gridiron gear formed the spearhead of Mike Keller's off-the-field strategy. He knew the Claymore's had a lot of ground to make up. 
We felt that we had a long way to go. We felt that the image of the Claymores in Scotland uh, definitely needed improvement. And of course, the success of the team was very much lacking, two and eight and the worst in the league. What we wanted to do from a football standpoint, and Coach Craner and I, having worked together in the past, we knew we could field a competitive team. We knew that uh, we would have a competitive team. And our, the other thing we needed to do in the front office was to develop a the image and perception of the Claymores as a first-class professional organization that was worthy for people to follow and for corporations to invest in. Early in the new year, NFL Commissioner Paul Tagliabue came to Scotland to reiterate the NFL's commitment to American football both here and across Europe. This is the second decade of, of our involvement, National Football League's involvement in developing American football in Europe. We started uh, back in 1986 and we've done a variety of things since then. So 1996 is, is the beginning of the second decade and that's sort of a benchmark for us and we are pleased. Last year was the first time ever that we had a, a, a league in Europe that was exclusively based in Europe with multiple countries and teams participating and we think that that set a good foundation that we can build on. Sharing the top table with the league's top brass was a man already legendary in Scotland. Gavin Hastings joined the Claymores as a marketing consultant but whatever Paul Tagliabue said to him must have kindled Gavin's competitive fires because the very next week the worst kept secret in sport was out. Gavin Hastings would kick for the Claymores. It's something that uh, has been, you know, in the forefront of my mind for, for a few months now. And I guess that when I was over um, in the new year and I went along to the Denver Broncos training camp, and, and until then, you know, it was always just a sort of almost fantasy. But we, we had a good afternoon session there and I quite enjoyed it. And I guess that was when uh, I thought, well, yeah, I'm quite keen to take this forward. Before a team of champions could be assembled to join Gavin, Coach Kreiner had to build a winning coaching staff and he had to get the formula right. I, I hired defensively first. Um, I knew that, that uh, in order for us to have a chance to develop the offense, since it was all going to be brand new, that we had to have a, a defensive team and staff that would be good early in the season while the offense was developing. And uh, so I went and hired my old friend Ray Wilsey, who had tremendous uh, experience not only in the NFL and in the colleges in the States, but also in the World League. And Ray gave me the maturity uh, to, to build the defense around. Uh, then came another one of my old time buddies is, is Bill Dutton, who I had, I had brought in after the fourth game of the season last year, or the year before. And uh, Bill came in to handle the defensive line. And then I was fortunate enough to uh, pluck Larry Owens out of a junior college. And so I, when that defensive staff was put together, I knew we had a chance to be good. And offensively, my number one choice was Jim Soker, who had been an extremely successful head coach in the college division in the States. And mine and Jim's offensive philosophy coincide very, very closely. So I knew that that would be a good match. And when I was able to to uh, entice Jim to come. Uh, I was real excited about that. And my next choice was a young coach by the name of Vince Acaldi, who uh, was an excellent player at, at uh, Boise State, a school that I had coached at for seven years, and who fit the philosophy that I wanted. Uh, that was a plus. So uh, I took Mike Kenny and made him an offensive coach, and that rounded out the, the offensive staff. And it was a staff that I knew not only had the football skills and knowledge that, that we needed, but it was also a staff that I knew would work very well together and give us that chemistry that would allow the players to work in an atmosphere that, that uh, they not only could see how they were going to get better, but also allow them, you know, as a team to work together and give us the best that they had. Uh, and in the end, that's how you win championships, and it all fell into place very nicely. March 1996, Atlanta, Georgia. The Claymores come together for the first time at Carrollton, 60 miles west of the city, for a grueling four weeks of training camp. Returning veterans from 95, allocated players from the NFL, strong new national players, and some hot draft picks. Out of 60 at camp, only 42 could make the final cut. The World League's leading rusher from 95, Saran Stacy, was in evidence, and he signaled his loyalties. Claymores. 
The training would be long, intense, and extremely demanding. One young man from Glasgow, a Claymore in 95, was once again determined to give his all and make the final team. To Scott Cooper, known to his teammates as Scoops, the change from 95's training camp was immediately evident. Year one, we had Larry Kaharic. It was a Kaharic camp we were at, and it was tough. And um, Jim Craner took over when we actually came back to Scotland. So this year, uh, so the 96 season, it was all Craner's camp, and uh, it was it was different. Um, it was very very hard work. Uh, we had a lot and a lot of meetings which we didn't have in the first year. We were doing 14 hour days. We were practicing twice a day for three hours, and uh, and that was every day for the month. And it, it really takes it out of you, but. Uh, managed to survive it and uh, come back to, to Scotland for the season. A big part of training was practice games against the other World League teams. In the first scrimmage against the London Monarchs, returning safety George Coghill displayed his superb skills on defense, snagging a fine interception and powering downfield. The heartbeat of the defense was back. Gavin Hastings took his first kick under game conditions and showed he had what it takes. Jim Ballard tried out his throwing arm against Frankfurt Galaxy and found that he had a gifted receiver in Sean LaChapelle, who was allocated to the Claymores from the Kansas City Chiefs. Gavin Hastings continued to hit the bullseye. Against the Amsterdam Admirals, Marcus Thomas, another Claymores veteran from 95, found his way in for an early touchdown. But Amsterdam treated the scrimmage like a regular season game and went all out to beat the Claymores. Amsterdam won the scrimmage, but this preseason defeat did not dampen Coach Kreiner's spirits. On the contrary, the Claymores displayed little of their game plan but learned a lot about their opponents. I was very pleased. We sat down as a coaching staff and we made our game plans, not only what we were going to do in all three phases of the game, offense and defense and special teams, but also we developed a philosophy. And we threw an awful lot at our players early, but we didn't show very much in our scrimmages against the other teams. But rather, we concentrated on fundamental development and bringing our players along at a, at a uh, level that enabled them to make steady progress uh, every single day that we were in training camp. And we knew that once we got into the season and started playing games that that would pay dividends both in being able to keep the players healthy once we got to Europe and we didn't have 60 players but rather would be reduced to 42 because we would have a fundamental base and therefore we wouldn't have to spend a lot of time once we got to Europe hitting. And so we worked on techniques and skill development and it paid off for us. And, and uh, even though we didn't show a lot to our opponents, our players performed very well in the scrimmages because of their technique uh, and their skill development. The battle-hardened Claymores arrived home and settled down into their new base at Glasgow Central Hotel. Coach Kreiner gave a beginning. progress report. Well, we're excited and happy to be, number one, to be home and to be back in Scotland. Uh, for the start of the uh, 1996 season. Uh, we had a good, uh, a good camp. We accomplished most of our goals. I wouldn't say that we accomplished every one of them. Uh, I think that you'll, you will be uh, uh, very pleased with, a, uh, with what has taken place uh, on the offensive side of the football because we're going to be uh, a much more exciting, uh, more wide open uh, style of offense and, and we I think did an excellent job of filling in and correcting the weaknesses that our football team had last year. The Claymores continued to focus and train hard in the final weeks of preseason. Strathclyde University's training grounds at Steps was the stage on which the team coalesced into a unified gridiron fighting machine. The hard work of the players combined with incisive coaching to produce a team that was prepared to taste victory. If you believe that they are going to do something to give us a chance to win the game, and you're playing your ass off that way, it'll happen that way. And you know as well as I do that that's the way your championship teams won those games, because you were playing harder than the other team. One, two, three, play more! After the sweat and effort of the practice field, another part of the groundwork, a team trip to the movies for a special screening, the film Braveheart. 
a history lesson, and a valuable psychological preparation for the first game of the season against the old enemy, the London Monarchs. The Claymores got the message. Number one this year. I think it'll help us play. Uh, I think we can, uh, you know, we can learn more about the rich tradition of the Scottish way, and then we can sort of, you know, build upon that. You know, we sort of take that with us when we go down and play the English. Just hearing some of the things about uh, William Wallace and, and some of the great things he does. Hopefully, you know, on uh, Sunday I'll be able to do some of those things. Well, we feel that we're a national team. We represent the nation of Scotland, and uh, this weekend we have our big game against the English, and no better time to see the movie Braveheart and get the team ready for the battles to come than uh, just prior to this ball game. The game plan was in place. The fans brought their faith in the team south to London, and the Claymores took the field against the Monarchs. London had signed up William Perry, the football legend of the 1980s. They hoped the fridge would be able to put the Claymores on ice. The stakes were high. Not just the rivalry, but a new trophy, the Budweiser Cup, would go to the victors in the first game of the season as the Claymores battled the London Monarchs. Gordon gets us underway. Thomas steps up, and in fact, Fuller gets in front of him, takes it past the 20, finds a hole still on his feet, past the 30, over 40 to midfield before he's pushed out of bounds. Great start, David Gordon was there, the kicker that came up and actually pushed him out of bounds. A great start for the Scottish Claymores on special teams, James Fuller with the return. Claymore's quarterback Steve Matthews hadn't played a game in anger for two seasons and he had trouble finding his form, but seven plays and two timeouts later, he began to spark into life. in the backfield. Matthews drops. He's got a man, has he? It's a touchdown for the Claymores. It's got to <laughs> Yo Murphy. Nice catch by Murphy. It was great coverage right there. Murphy just went up and took the ball right away from him. Watch the coverage. They come with the blitz. A nice job of picking up the blitz inside. Allows Matthew to have time and throw the ball up high. Did you see at the end how Yo Murphy went back and got that ball at its high point. Watch Crocker, he's working to the inside, nice position, good break on the ball. Here, here's the difference. The, he goes up, comes back, and grabs it at the highest point, and of course, he comes down with the touchdown. High snap, Terry Carr brings it down, and it goes through. Gavin Hastings has made a perfect start to his career as a professional American footballer, and I bet the butterflies were going. A convincing opening for the Claymores and their rookie kicker. Things were looking even better for the Scots when Monarchs rusher Russell White was stripped by Claymore's defensive captain Mark Sander on London's first drive. But Claymore trigger man Steve Matthews blew the momentum when he was picked off by London cornerback Kenny McIntyre. McIntyre took full advantage of the Claymore's error and handed the Monarchs great field position. But the Monarchs couldn't capitalize either. No touchdown, and even their field goal try pulled right. David Gordon suffering the humiliation. In the second quarter, London got their running game into gear, and quarterback Preston Jones found his own rhythm. The Monarchs started to get hot, and the roof began to cave in on the Claymores. Second down. Vincent with the catch and the touchdown. Jones looks, gets Gaston Green, touchdown London. Nice play. And Matthews is looking and is in trouble again. Jeff Hunter That's nailed stupid. him and it's picked off by Darren Studd still. And this could be more trouble for Scotland, and it is. Touchdown London, they're running riot. By halftime, the Claymores had a mountain to climb. They had conceded 21 unanswered points in the second quarter. Coach Kreiner must have borrowed a couple of pages from William Wallace's playbook because the Claymores came out swinging in the second half. We pick it up with the Bravehearts at midfield facing a crucial third and ten. Matthews gets pressure, gets it off. Oh, I like that play. La Chapelle trips up, maybe short of the first down mark. Stacy and Dickerson in the backfield. Big fourth down, this for Scotland. Stacey gets it and gets enough. Second down. Matthews, pressure, gets rid of it. Well, they're screening these guys to death. La Chapelle again on the outside. Almost the same identical play that set up that third down again here. Four minutes left, third quarter. They've moved it inside the 15-yard line of the London Monarchs. Murphy and La Chapelle are in out wide. They look for La Chapelle, who is stopped inside the five. Gang tackled. 
nice job of Lachapelle knowing where he is. And a nice throw by Matt. Bobby Hammond with that 14-point cushion, but looking to preserve it. It's first down and goal. Late third quarter. Motion from Sean Lachapelle. Dickerson fumbles. And who is going to come up with that? This is a huge play for Scotland. They've got to recover it. There's the snap there. He just handed it to him perfect. Oh, he never just had it. Never, never put his hands on it. But made sure he got it back. Matthews fakes to Stacey. He then looks and goes for the bootleg. And does he get in? No, they're oh, saying he nice didn't make back. it. Third down and not a lot. La Chapelle in motion. The pitch back is to Stacey and he's in. Touchdown Scotland and we have a ball game. 27, he's going to go to his right. The play is designed to stretch the defense and create a hole. Now, once you have him commit, see, he's 52, Caesar. He flowed outside. Stacy just broke it back inside and really did it all in his own. Gavin Hastings maintained his 100% extra point record as the Scots clawed a little more ground back from the Monarchs. The score, 21 to 14. The Claymores trailing only by a touchdown. Matthews finds Stacy. Stacy with some work to do. And oh does it. boy, he got a first down, and that was all Saran Stacy. Well, it's 3:19 left. Scotland down by seven. Stacy picks his way to the 40-yard line. Ivan Caesar on the stop. Second down. Stacy, the workhorse again, picks his way closer. Flag comes in late in the London backfield. Personal foul, smearing number 25 against the defense. That is Kevin Gaines. And that hurts the London Monarchs. The Scottish Claymores on the move at the 24. Stacey again, doesn't get bit. Lewis Capes stuck with it. And got some help from Nick Smith, but Lewis Capes, the British national, made that play, and doesn't he know it? Dickerson and Stacey in the backfield. Matthews drops, gets pressure, gets rid of it. Looks Got for it. La Chapelle, touchdown Scotland. What a play. And a great job by Ron Dickerson up front with the block, which allowed Matthews to have the time to find La Chapelle. Remember, a long, deep crossing route like that takes lots of time to develop. La Chapelle got beyond because Dickerson made the block up front. I want you to watch Dickerson, the fullback, number 23, is going to step up right over there. See him? Boom. And Saran Stacy as well with the block. And that allows La Chapelle to get beyond the defender and take it into the end zone. That superb catch from Sean La Chapelle meant that Gavin Hastings was called upon to tighten up the laces on his boots for a high pressure kick. He's been in bigger pressure situations than this, but that's in his own game. He's in a different game now. He's two for two so far. He's got to nail this one. Terry Card, the holder. High snap, Card gets it down. He still things, nails it like he was born there. When the going gets tough, the tough get level. Hastings showing some of his big match experience to tie the scores at 21 all with just 1 minute 53 left in the ballgame. The Claymores were given the chance to win it when London stalled. Sonny Fexico sliced his punt out of bounds and gave the Scots good field position at their own 30-yard line. Coach Hammond let his feelings be known to poor old Sonny. But Matthews betrayed his inexperience by throwing a third interception, this time on a misrun pass route, but once again pulled down by Sean Crocker. The Monarchs couldn't move it, and with just three seconds left, it was down to David Gordon to try to win it from 38 yards. Well, the pressure's on David Gordon. This for the game. He did it for Boston College against Notre Dame in 93. Can he do it for London against Scotland? Shanked it. And no. It never had a shot. Heartbreak for David Gordon, but delight for Jim Kreiner. The game going into overtime. The Claymores won the toss and elected to kick off, giving first possession in the 10-minute overtime to the Monarchs, who couldn't move it, and they were forced to punt. That meant that the Claymores could win it with a score. Second down and 10 for the Scottish Claymores. Matthews with pressure coming, gets rid of it quickly. And there's some running room here for Sean LaChapelle, who eventually gets hit by Andre Allen. A flag comes in, but that was a huge play. That hope turns to abject despair on the very next play when Steve Matthews was sacked by London defensive end A.J. Jenkins. That meant that third down was a do-or-die proposition. 
Matthews goes upstairs on third down. Oh, what a catch! Sean LaChapelle has just come up with what could be a game winner what a for the Scottish play. Claymores. The Claymores called on Saran Stacey to gain the short yardage. Stacey looking to go in inside the five to around the three. Third down at about the three. They stay on the ground. Matthews gets nailed, flattened. Andre Allen. But that was enough for Kreiner. He sent in Paul McCallum to win the game from 27 yards. The boos go up. This for the game. High enough, good enough. Scotland win in overtime. Glory to the Scottish Claymores. Paul McCallum, sensational game winner, capping a 17-point comeback to leave the Monarchs without a crown and the all-new gridiron tartan army on cloud nine. George Cockhill and Ben Torriero wasted no time getting their hands on the prize. The Scottish Lions rampant once again. The Claymores showed off their first silverware, the Budweiser Cup, and Ben Torriero had a message for everyone back home. We came back from the dead. That's something that you didn't see last year. Oh, you balti, you balti, we're back. All of a sudden, this football team that had been last the year before now was in a tie with anyone else that won their football game that first week, and we were rewarded by for it by doing so, by winning on the road and winning the Bud Trophy. So it was, I think it was a big plus for our football players and again, it just added to the confidence level that our team had. Gridiron debutant Gavin Hastings got a boost to his confidence level when he tied the scores in the fourth. Nerve wracking? It was. I mean, I still have nightmares about it now because I thought, my God, what would have happened if I'd missed it? But, uh, you know, I think everything about that first day down at White Hart Lane was, was a memorable experience and just playing in, in that atmosphere and, and in the music and against the fridge, I mean, he was, he was putting me under a bit of pressure, I think. I mean, he threatened to sit on me, which would have been the world's <laughs> worst experience. So, you know, from that point of view, it was, it was a great day and obviously it put uh, the Claymore season off to a great start. In week two, the Claymores hosted the Barcelona Dragons at Murrayfield in the first home game of 1996. Just under 13,000 turned out in the hopes of witnessing a Claymore's first victory at home. Coach Kreiner was keen to deliver the home fans a victory, but Dragons coach Jack Bicknell was hoping for a repeat of last season. After the coin toss, the Scots faced off against the Dragons, who were coming off an impressive overtime win against Amsterdam in week one. Murray Field, Edinburgh, Scotland, and the Claymores kick it away. Barcelona receiving. Marvin Marshall takes a kickoff, crosses a 20, and he is dragged down at the 26. Claymore's defensive tackle, number 90, mighty Joe O'Brien, delighted in the first skirmish, and the Claymore's D began to hit hard. Shannon Jones causing Dragon running back Charles Thompson to fumble away possession on Barcelona's first drive. The Claymore's marched on downfield, and Paul McCallum put through a 33-yard field goal for the first Claymore's points on Scottish soil in 1996. That cheered the hearts of the home fans. David Wilson was a bit overzealous, and it looked like pass interference when the number 25 swatted Kenny Shedd in the end zone. The referees called it an incomplete pass, but to Jack Bicknell... That was unbelievable! Nevertheless, the Claymores carried a 3 to zip lead into the second quarter, and the Dragons had to bite on a bad call. David Wilson had a chance to display better timing and consummate skill in the secondary. Holcomb in trouble, and then fires across the middle, and it's picked off. David Wilson, who got away with an interference call in the end zone, gets his first interception of the season at the 37-yard line. Third down and one. The pitch to Stacy. First down to the nine before being tackled by Tim Watson. One thing that Saran Stacy does that I like He's a great runner in terms of balance and acceleration. But watch here the way he follows his blocker. Knowing exactly when to accelerate, which way to cut. And he's always falling forward for that extra yardage. Tell you what, I would be very surprised if he didn't have a look in somebody's camp this year. It's about time that Saran Stacy got a shot to help somebody, because I think he can. Well, they go to the first man through. By a halo, and he gets a couple of yards. He's in trouble here. Broke the first tackle, but cannot escape. 
the arms of number 91, linebacker Kevin O'Brien. Third and long for Matthews. And he throws wide open into the end zone. Touchdown, La Chapelle. The same kind of pressure on the outside, but watch the way Matthew says, okay, I'll just step up in this pocket. Great protection by Hunt inside and spots the open man on the run. And I'll tell you, the fact that he's left-handed, Tom, that ball comes out of there kind of screwy. The defense isn't used to looking at that. And the Claymore's padded there lead to 10 when Gavin Hastings kicked the extra point, his first score at Murray Field in a helmet and shoulder pads. Paul McCallum booted two field goals for Scotland to lengthen their lead 16 to zero. But Dragons receiver Kenny Shedd beat out the secondary to catch a perfect pass and run it all the way in for a touchdown, giving Barcelona renewed hope, 16 to seven. On the Claymore's next drive, Steve Matthews began to repay Coach Kreiner's confidence in him as the first choice for quarterback. And Matthews drops the throw. Good protection down the middle of the field. And it's broken up. Was it intercepted? No, are they saying he made the catch? You gotta be kidding. Yo, Murphy all the way at the five. A wave of unease began to break out over Cowboy Jack, and three plays later came the wipeout. La Chapelle in motion to give to Stacy. Touchdown, Claymore. Well, we know he can run outside, we know he can dance, but he can be tough when he has to. He didn't have to be tough very long, and that ball's in the air. It doesn't matter. It looked as though he crossed the plane. But if you're going to run the ball, who would you rather run over? A guy that's 383, a guy that's 308? I'll take my chances going over both those guys. That's a lot of beef, pal. And the extra point just barely able to sneak through. Saran Stacy could take pride in his performance, but he only wanted to send a message to mom. The Dragons managed an unconverted touchdown to make the final score 23 to 13, but the day belonged to the Claymores, and more importantly, the fans who had finally tasted that elusive home victory they craved so much. Gavin Hastings started to party hardy, and the players indulged in some mutual admiration with the gridiron faithful. For Jim Kreiner, an important bond had been forged. It was a, it was a big win for us, not only because we, we now could show our fans how good a football team we are, uh, but also we were playing against a very good football team in Barcelona who, especially on the offensive side, you know, had a lot of returning starters and, and were very, very capable. Our defense played extremely well and shut them down. And offensively, uh, we had three real good drives in that ball game and, and scored enough points to win the game. And, and not only now were we 2-0, and oh, but uh, we had won at home and showed our own fans what kind of a football team we were going to be. The ecstatic response of the Scottish Gridiron fans buoyed the Claymores, and Jim Kreiner acknowledged the vital role of that 12th man. You know, you have a tendency to, to forget from one year to the next when you've got so many other things on your mind. And, and in uh, 1995, our, our crowd, our fans had been very vocal and enthusiastic in supporting our team in a mostly a losing effort. Well, they returned with that same kind of enthusiasm, and when we gave them something to cheer about, they demonstrated what they were going to be, how good a crowd they were going to be, and they really were very vocal. And this meant something to our players, and it helped establish a real bond between the players and the fans that they were able to carry throughout the season. Of course, when you go to Murray Field to see the Claymores, you don't just get 60 minutes of football action. You get a three-hour party thrown in at no extra charge. Entertainment, refreshments, oodles of stuff to keep adults, families, and young people involved in a feel-good atmosphere that's hard to beat. In week three, the Claymores invited over 2,000 scouts and Cub Scouts to be their guests at the game. This was just one indication of the Scottish Claymore's commitment to encourage youth development of American football in Scotland. And the scouts soon got into the swing of things. Another bumper crowd of 
just over 13,000 greeted the 2-0 Claymores on a beautifully sunny April afternoon. The opposition of the day, the highly fancied Amsterdam Admirals. The Claymores had never beaten the Admirals before, and the Braveheart veterans of 95 were especially keen to silence the trash talk. The two teams were at the top of their game, a high standard of football was expected, and no one was disappointed. Third and five for the Claymores from just outside the 50-yard line. Matthews under heavy pressure, and look at that catch by Willie Tate. Up close to a first down yardage. Excellent awareness on the part of Willie Tate. You're going to see here that Steve Matthews comes under pressure from Malcolm Scholl. He holds his feet, makes a throw downfield, and look at one-handed grab behind his back, too. Talented guy. You can take another look at the catch here. I'll tell you, Willie Tate is a guy, the rap on him is he has great hands. And it shows right there. Tate, a great catch, giving the Claymores their second first down, and the swing pass out to Stacy. In the worst spot, the hands, huh? <laughs> Second and nine, play fake from Matthews, comes to the near side and hits Dickerson, who breaks a tackle on the near side, spins up inside the 40-yard line before he's pushed out by Rico Mack. Third down and five, and Matthews back to throw again. Comes near side, hits Dickerson, up close to another first down. I believe they have it. Before, he's brought down by O'Neill, the nickel backer that you just spoke about, but Scotland moving the ball downfield just as they want it. La Chapelle in motion to the far side, and the give to Saran Stacy dances through a hole, gets inside the 30 to the 28-yard line. Another pretty decent pickup. Robert O'Neill on the tackle again. Pitch to the far side, and Stacy has a hole. Stacy gets all the way down to close to the 10-yard line before he's knocked out by Kelly Sims. Nice play. Watch the fullback 23, Ron Dickerson. He makes the key block right there on Robert O'Neill. And that springs the whole thing. Second and five, the pitch to Stacy. Another big hole. He'll score easily. Watch the two key blocks. Purvis on the guard, 79 kicking out. And then the lead block again. Fullback Ron Dickerson cuts his man, and it's right into the end zone for Saran Stacy. And Scottish rugby legend Gavin Hastings on for the extra point. He's been perfect on five PATs this season. And Saran Stacy just couldn't keep his foot off the gas. In the first quarter alone, he clocked up 102 yards. This 35-yard scramble came on the Claymore's very next possession. 1996 was shaping up to be another record-breaking year for Saran Stacy. His running propelled a seven-play drive down to the Admirals' 18, and the Claymores were all set to score. But the Amsterdam Admirals are a team who are always ready to take advantage. Another big third down as we end uh, near the end of the first quarter. That pass is deflected and intercepted by Rico Mack. And Mack has a convoy. He'll go. Rico Mack turns the tide. For Jim Kreiner, the grin was gone, but his smile soon returned with a piece of genuine Scottish sporting history. Third down, goal to go on the five. Matthews, touchdown. Scott Cooper again. First career touchdown, and look at him. <laughs> he is in heaven. And so is everybody here in Scotland. <laughs> There's a happy guy, Eric. They've got another reason to party here in Edinburgh as if they need one. The National has scored his first career touchdown here in the World League. The extra point by Gavin Hastings, another national hero, is good. And the Scottish Claymores have a 14-7 lead. That was a terrific catch by Scott Cooper. Touch number 23, Ron Dickerson, pick up the blitz to make this whole thing happen. See the time he bought him? 
And when you have a, when you have that situation of a blitzing linebacker, you're going to create a one-on-one -on -one situation with Scott Cooper. In American football, you try to conceal what you're doing from your opponent for as long as possible. In the third quarter, the Admirals offered up what looked like a punt. Adam Vintieri on the fake, and look, they have faked out everyone, and Kelly Sims has the football. He's got to beat Lee Gissendana to the goal line and does. Touchdown. What a play. Everybody in this stadium faked out by that one. The key to the fake punt is for the kicker to make everyone believe the ball has gone way over his head. Kelly Sims grabbed the pigskin, and the Claymore's defense was split wide open. No one was there to stop him, but Lee Gissendaner never gave up, felling Sims just a little too late. But the Claymore's hit right back with a fake of their own. Keep your eye on number 40. Third and three, and the fake went to Marcus Thomas, and Steve Matthews kept it himself and rolls it into the end zone. That time you saw two run plays, a play action, and then he comes out of the naked bootleg, takes it all the way in for the end zone. Gavin Hastings will convert after the high snap. Terry Carr put it down beautifully for him, and Hastings puts it through. A convincing victory for the Claymores, 21 to 14 over the Admirals. For Scott Cooper, a major milestone in his gridiron career. I was standing in the huddle that day, and they called uh, the play for me to run a flagging up. And I thought, well, this could be it. This could be my chance. And uh, I ran a nice part, and, and I beat the guy, but he actually tried to hold me. And uh, I laid out for the ball, and and I didn't come up with it, the ball just slipped out and I thought, that's it, my chance is, is come and gone. I went back to the huddle and uh, a couple of plays later, Steve Matthews called, called a play. Uh, and we, we caught them in man coverage, where actually it's just a man on you, they're not covering zones. And I thought, this could go to me again, if I run a nice pattern here I might, I might break open. Sure enough, a cut and a shallow cross pattern it's called. And I just thought, I'm open, if Steve sees me, I've got a chance here and, and he did. And I just remembered, Focusing on the ball, making sure I, I caught it and just turning and seeing that goal line. And I just heard the roar of the crowd and I just started roaring and it was just crazy. Anyone who uh, ever plays a sport, an amateur sport as a hobby or whatever, they always dream about, about doing what they love on the big stage. And I, and I was getting a chance and to stand there and, and get the respect of your, your peers, the other players, and just to, to hear the noise from the stands and people cheering. There's, there's no feeling on earth like it. This was a big, big touchdown, not only for our fans, but for our team as well, who think so much of Scotty and, and the whole team celebrated with Scotty in the end zone on this one. And so it was a big game and one that meant an awful lot to our players. Um, Amsterdam had been billed as the team to beat in the league. And this put us uh, in a position right now where we were now the team to beat. And uh, basically that if you were going to get to the World Bowl, you had to come through Scotland. The Claymores hit the road in week four, taking on Ryan Fire in Dusseldorf. Injuries were beginning to plague the Scottish side, but they had three wins so far in the season. Ryan Fire had three losses, but victory was by no means a certainty for the Bravehearts. The Claymores faced a potent enemy in the form of tight end Byron Chamberlain. He capped the Fire's opening drive with a clean catch from quarterback Andy Kelly. The pat was no good, and the Fire led by six. Two possessions later, the Claymores had reached the Rhine 21. Steve Matthews swung a pass out to Saran Stacy, who just couldn't find a reason to stay out of the end zone. Gavin Hastings converted and the Claymores led 7-6. Two field goals for the fire gave them a 12-7 advantage, but Steve Matthews and Sean LaChapelle relaunched their double act. Matthews goes upstairs, looks, and has he come down with it? Touchdown, Scotland. What a big play to Sean LaChapelle. 33 yards, and that was a tremendous catch. Once more, the Claymores were hitting on all cylinders. Saran Stacy faked the handoff, and Steve Matthews had plenty of time to find Sean LaChapelle. The lanky receiver timed his catch to perfection and wrested the ball from two defenders. No wonder Sean LaChapelle was the hottest receiver on the Claymores roster. The Claymores led 14 to 12 after Gavin Hastings converted. But the fire made it down to the Claymore's six yard line and Leo Aragus booted through a three pointer to make it 15, 14 Ryan fire. With only one point in it, the match was true to the form of all the Claymore's Ryan fire encounters so far. Just before the two minute warning, the fire had a third and three on their own 30 yard line and Andy Kelly decided to go long. 
The pass was overthrown, and that meant the Fire would probably have to give up possession on the next play, but suddenly Boris Cheek threw a penalty flag from the sidelines, and confusion reigned. It looked like the line judge simply tripped, and there ought to have been a warning if the Claymore's players were too close to the field. After a discussion, referee Phil Luckett delivered a surprising verdict. We have an unsportsmanlike conduct on Scotland. No! The first down after 15 yard penalty. We have we've not received one single warning the entire oh, ball game. Yeah, you, you, now you know that's not true. I'm no, 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 I'm the backup. It was a tough call that meant that Line Fire could retain possession and run the clock out there by becoming the victors 15 to 14. Coach Kreiner was magnanimous in defeat as he congratulated Galen Hall on his first win this season. Dusseldorf had, had uh, played well, but had lost three ball games by a very, very small margin. And we didn't play particularly well. And uh, so all of a sudden we end up in a dogfight that, that uh, went right down to the wire and Dusseldorf won the game by one point. And uh, it is a, a disappointing game for us, but also a very, very valuable lesson. And uh, we didn't play well on offense, and, and uh, our defense had kept us in the ball game, but we weren't able to capitalize on any of the opportunities that they gave us. So it was a tough game, but one that we learned from and one that would set the stage for the big game the following week in our uh, first half showdown with Frankfurt. And what about uh, Boris Cheek's contribution to the game? <laughs> well, uh, the, the officiating was less than magnificent. Uh, and, and I think that, that we're probably better off letting it go at that. <laughs> Week five, the Waldstadion, Frankfurt, Germany. The showdown that would decide which team would host the World Bowl. A huge crowd of over 32,000 Galaxy faithful turned out to see the game. Coach Kreiner and the Claymores were single-minded in pursuit of victory, but Galaxy under head coach Ernie Stockner were unbeaten at 4-0 and displayed confidence. The Claymores had everything to play for in the most important game of their history thus far. The underdog Claymores bit first. Steve Matthews unloaded a 41-yard bomb to Sean LaChapelle on their second possession. But it looked like becoming a bit of a dog day afternoon for the Scots when fullback Jared Cuyahalo fumbled the ball after making some good yardage and gave possession to Frankfurt. But the Galaxy couldn't do anything with it. Quarterback Steve Palour's timing was off after a week out injured and George Coghill showed how a safety earns his pay. We pick up the action on the Claymore's next drive at second and eight on their own 30 yard line. Matthews looks, has a man wide open to midfield. LaChapelle beats one man. Now it's a foot race, and he's down at about the 25 by Mark Byers, who came back at line, from linebacker, but they work Lance Gunn again. Stacy with a hole, gets inside the 20 and falls forward down to about the 17-yard line. Seven good yards on the ground for Saran. Brings up a nice-looking second and three for the Scottish Claymores. Looking to break open early. Stacy has some work to do now. Gets past Mike Kerr and will be short of first down yardage by about a yard. Kerr got some help from Reginald Lee, the linebacker. Third and a yard from the Galaxy 15-yard line. The Claymores looking to keep this drive alive. They go with Stacy, who picks his way through and may not have got it. Bernard Carter made a big hit, and that's going to be a question of where they spot it. Let's kick it. Jumbo, Jumbo, get in and kick it. Jumbo. And Paul McCown has drilled it. It's certainly got the distance, and it's accurate as well. And with 1.46 remaining in the first quarter, the Claymores have broken on top. Paul McCallum right, you know with a 32-yard kick. Things swung back in the home team's favor at the start of the second quarter when Lee Gissendaner couldn't hold on to a Frankfurt punt, and the ball was scooped up by Lance Gunn. But Lee got off the hook when Forey Duckett wrested a Steve Palour pass away from Jay Kearney. Once again, however, the Claymore's offense got mired down, and Frankfurt got possession. Palour picked up where he left off, once more firing at Jay Kearney, 23 yards. But when he aimed at Mario Bailey on the next play, George Coghill again leaped high out of the secondary to snag the pigskin and give the Claymores sensational field position for their next drive. Once again, the fearsome Claymores D handed the offense the platform for a fresh attack. 
Matthews drops the pass, gets pressure, gets it off, and he's looking for Yo Murphy, and he's got him down at the eight-yard line. Murphy coming in ahead of Fred Foggy. But the Claymores couldn't get any closer. With 40 seconds left in the half, Paul McCallum was sent in for a field goal to stretch it to six. 27 yards, certainly long enough and wide, and that's the first miss and for a Scottish Claymores kicker this season. Paul McCallum's uncharacteristic miss fired up the Galaxy fans. At halftime, Steve Pelluer was replaced by Brad Bretz, and James Williams went on a lone cornerback blitz to drop him for a nine-yard loss. Galaxy had to punt, and that set up a historic opportunity for Saran Stacy. Matthews gives to Stacy, who trips and forwards for about four yards. And that was enough to make Saran Stacy the World League's all-time leading rusher, more than 1,121 yards over a season and a half. But despite his record-breaking run, the Claymore's offense had to punt. Brad Brett still in for the injured Steve Pallor at quarterback. Brett's pump fakes, goes long, looks for Mario Bailey, picked off by the Claymore's defense again. James Fuller against the team that cut him in preseason. Payback time for James Fuller, but again, the Claymore's found it hard to advance, and Paul McCallum came in. 25-yard field goal should be automatic. Certainly long enough. Is it good enough? It is. Paul made good after his earlier miss, and that put the Claymore's up six to zip. We pick up the play-by-play -play at the start of the fourth. Second down and ten for Frankfurt. Looking to break their duck. Pressure comes. Coggill on the blitz. It's picked off! They've done it again, Arnold Allay, past the 40 to midfield. The Scottish defence is playing a storming game. Fine, fine heads-up play by Arnold Ali. But the guy who makes this play is number 54, Mark Sanders. Watch him to the left of your screen. He goes out and he has the back. And when he sees the back, he times it perfectly. And his helmet is on the ball, on contact. It pops out Arnold Ali. Nice heads-up awareness. Frankfurt, every time it looks like they've moved into a scoring position, this Scottish defense has come up with a turnover. And now Steve Matthews has excellent field position to try and put it away. The play action, he looks, he's got a man, Sean LaChapelle, down to about the 32-yard line. Chris Hall pushed him out of bounds. Good for 15 yards and another Claymore's first down. Siran Stacy on the ground, looks for his blockers, cuts back inside, picks up around seven or eight yards before Don Reynolds eventually trips him up. But another impressive piece of running from the man from Alabama. On the ground again, Stacy looks, picks, works, jinx, and gets enough for a first down. He must have changed directions three times there, Saran Stacy, and they'll move the chains. Tom Cavallo on the stop. The first down, Scotland leading by six, nine and a half minutes left in the ball game. Matthews looks, goes over the middle, got a man, touchdown, Scotland! Sean LaChapelle! Look at the last two plays. That's the two guys they were supposed to stop. The last play was 27, they were supposed to stop him, they didn't. This time, it's Sean LaChapelle. He draws man-to-man -man coverage, and when it comes time to catch the ball, he just separates himself from Fred Frog. On its way, and good. Sean LaChapelle silenced the Valdstadian crowd and handed the Claymores a vital 13-0 lead. Sean ran a superbly executed post route that just split Galaxy's coverage wide open and left cornerback Fred Foggy no chance. But Frankfurt took over with just nine minutes left and a mountain to climb. Brett's goes upstairs, looks for Bailey, and it's picked off again, Fuller. and it's James Fuller, and that and is the final the insult. Ball right on front of the Frankfurt Galaxy. I think it almost hit Ernie Stottner on the foot. He's made a point. James Fuller is an excitable boy this evening. I think Warren Zevon had him in mind when he was talking about an excitable boy. Great break on the ball. Frankfurt are in trouble. 
They go on the ground. Saran Stacey eventually trips his way to midfield. A pickup of six yards to bring up a second down and four, and they're under well, nine minutes. Say, my mom, I'm a pizza home. K Dog, Jay, peace. Like a man here. We're going to take the world, Bowl, Scotland. I can't believe this is the same Claymore's team that I saw last week in Dusseldorf. They were very poor. Nothing poor about this. Matthews on the bootleg. Don Reynolds after him. Matthews will pick up a first down. Gutsy play from Matthews. He didn't go out of bounds. He took the hit. The Scottish Claymores have totally wiped out this Frankfurt offense. First and 10 at the 42-yard line of the Galaxy for the Scottish Claymores. Ahead by 13. Looking for more. Stacy trips his way through for just a couple. Frank Messmer, the first man there. Tom Cavallo finished it off. And the crowd here... Very quiet, a few jeers and whistles, but not much flag waving or shouting. Swing pass to Sir Saran Stacey in the flat, who's going to get a first down and more. Still on his feet, Stacey to the 22 yard line. First down and 10. The pitch back goes to Stacey again, who cuts back inside, stays on his feet, down to the 15. One man to beat. Jukes and fakes to the eight, a pickup of 15. Chris Hall eventually on the stop, but this is adding insult to injury. 5.30 left, motion from Scott Cooper. He looks, he fires, he's got a man. It's stopped short of a touchdown. They're still playing it tough down there. Scott Cooper was thinking touchdown. Fred Foggy was thinking hit. Five minutes left. Scotland looking to put this one away. Ahead by 13, motion from Willie Tate, the tight end. The pitch back is to Marcus Thomas, who cuts inside. Touchdown, Scotland. Marcus Thomas with his first run of the night, and it's for six. I hate to say the Q word, but when you look at the defensive line of Frankfurt, getting pushed around off the ball on both sides of it. If they go to the left, they're pushed off the ball. If they go to the right, they're pushed off the ball. I mean, they, it appears to me that they just conceded. They said, hey, we can't stop what they're doing up front. We have no answers right now. And you know what we're seeing here in Frankfurt, something I've never seen before, fans leaving early. Flags come in, Hastings drills the extra point, but there are at least three flags. But the flags were against Galaxy, the score stood, and the reigning World Bowl champs were put to the sword, cut down to size by the Scottish Claymores. George Cockhill's safety blitz preserved the shutout, and all that was left to do was to douse victorious head coach Jim Kreiner in the traditional way. All the tension of the game just turned to joy in the moment of victory, something that Gavin Hastings was well familiar with. Amazing victory, the stuff of legends. To shut out the Frankfurt Galaxy at their home ground, the defense absolutely unstoppable. It was all going the way Coach Jim Kreiner had planned it. It was a tremendous feeling uh, for a lot, of, a lot of reasons. Not only because all of a sudden now, uh, we now Scotland truly is the place where you have to come if you want to win the World Bowl, but uh, our football players played so well in that game. Uh, at that point, there was no question we were by far the best football team in the World League. And as we looked at it as a coaching staff, uh, we were very gratified at where we were, but we're also now concerned about maintaining this momentum and this level of play for five more weeks before we do get a chance to play for the World Bowl and knowing that it's going to be in our backyard. The big games are when the big players come out to play. Um, I think that night, you know, that uh, the biggest player who stepped up that night was none other than my, my good friend himself, James Fuller. We picked James up off of waivers from Frankfurt Galaxy. Um, you know, he had a point to prove. You know, I mean, uh, and he proved it three times that that night. Uh, Saran just was his usual. You know, he was a stallion just running in a donkey derby. Um, nobody could stop him that night. Um, the quarterbacks themselves, they actually they matured that night as well into team leaders. The whole team, the Scottish Claymores, matured that night in Frankfurt.
Well, it was a magical night uh, for us, uh, myself in particular, having worked with the, the, uh, the Galaxy in the latter half of uh, 1995. And, uh, but it meant an awful lot to us because it was more or less the culmination of the turnaround for the team at that point. It meant that we were going to be in the World Bowl. It meant that we would be hosting the game at Murrayfield. And it meant that uh, the Scottish fan market that we were trying to penetrate uh, were going to be coming out to see us play, we felt. And so uh, it was really a transformation from top to bottom. And, and that was the night that uh, everything came home for us. It certainly did. I mean, it was a victory, but it was such an emphatic victory, wasn't it? Well, it was emphatic in that uh, we won 20 to nothing. Uh, we shut out the most powerful offensive team in the league. And even more than that, uh, I, I, don't, I think we were more or less written off by most people in the league. Uh, going into Frankfurt, playing in front of the largest uh, home crowd of the year uh, at that point, I think that everybody felt, well, uh, I know the Frankfurt Galaxy people were starting to print tickets for the World Bowl in uh, Frankfurt. So being able to go in, being able to stuff it you know, to a, a group of guys that were taking some things for granted uh, was very rewarding for all of us. So at the halfway point of the 96 World League season, the Claymores were at the summit, set to host the World Bowl, an incredible transformation from 1995. In week six, Ryan Fire came over to Murray Field. Remarkably, they were the only team in the league the Claymores had yet to beat. On the Claymores' first drive, Saran Stacy ran right through a porous Ryan Fire defense for a 31-yard touchdown run. Gavin Hastings pulled his conversion attempt to the left, but the Claymores led six to zip. Leo Aragus booted a Ryan Fire field goal to make it six to three, and on the Claymores' next possession, Matthews found Saran Stacy on a swing pass, and Saran did what he does best. Touchdown, Scotland. This time, Gavin Hastings was right on the money, and the score stood at 13 to three. Just into the second quarter, Jared Halo took the handoff and bulldozed straight into the end zone for a third Braveheart touchdown. The Claymores went for a two-point conversion and Sean LaChapelle came up with it. Paul McCallum notched up a field goal before halftime to make it 24-3, but to Ryanfire's credit, they piled up 16 unanswered points in the second half, but it wasn't enough. The Claymores had a famous victory, dousing the fire for the first time, 24-19, the final score. In week seven, the Frankfurt Galaxy came to Murray Field hungry to reassert their former dominance. And they were the first on the board when a Steve Matthews pass was tipped and Chris Hall plucked the pigskin from the sky, running it back over 27 yards for a touchdown. Paul McCallum booted a field goal to make it seven to three in favor of Frankfurt. And on the Claymore's first possession of the second half, Steve Matthews found Sean LaChapelle, just the way he'd been doing it all season long, 10-7 Claymore's. Ralph Kleineman leveled the scores with a 32-yard field goal for Galaxy, but the Claymores seized the lead once more when Herman Carroll swatted Steve Palua's pass, George Cockhill snagged it, and added 32 yards and another touchdown to his stats. The fans went wild. But Frankfurt weren't quitting this time. With one minute left on the clock, Brad Bretz hit Jay Kearney from the Claymores 44 with a bomb that pulled the Galaxy level 17 all. The Claymores had less than a minute to finish the Galaxy off in regulation time. Matthews found Sean LaChapelle for a 26-yard gain, which gave Paul McCallum a chance to clinch by a field goal with just six seconds before the whistle. It's good! What a play! Paul McCallum! Now, if you come out to see the Claymores, you might run into this man. He calls himself Captain Claymore, but is he for real? That's it, I'll tell you, I'm from a planet beyond the sun. I was polishing a radioactive claymore and it nicked my finger and suddenly I had special powers. Every time I go to the lavatory, I come out looking like this, I can't help it. It's just very embarrassing when I'm at work, but there you go. Anyway, claymores! But just who is that masked man? In week eight, the Claymores journeyed to Amsterdam to battle the Admirals, who were still contenders for the second World Bowl berth. It was the last time either team would meet in the Olympic Stadium. The Admirals were set to move into the brand new Amsterdam Arena for 97. The Admirals enjoyed a 10 to zip halftime lead when Steve Matthews had to leave the game after absorbing a direct hit from Admirals defensive lineman Jim Hanna. Jim Ballard came in at quarterback. He'd waited all season for the nod, and his presence registered immediately. 
Looks to the end zone, deep end zone, and it's caught by La Chapelle for a touchdown. Going up for La Chapelle as the catch out in front. Going to be a foot race midfield with the 40 to the 30 and down at the 20 yard line. First down and a give to Stacy. A reverse this time for Gisson Dater. He's got all kinds of blocking. He's got 20 a touchdown. to the 10 to the 5. Touchdown. Little fade pattern for Yo Murphy. Goes up. Got it, touchdown. Just that simple. The Claymore's well ahead, 21 to 10, but Admiral Philip Bobo clawed back a Dutch touchdown. Jim Ballard wasn't through yet, though. Going up again, going deep, got a man out touchdown. in front. It is La Chapelle for the score. And once again, perfect execution. Perfect execution. How about a perfect pass? Could that have been any sweeter? What touch by Ballard? Another Amsterdam touchdown made it 27 to 24, and with four minutes left, the Admiral's trigger man decided not to pull the trigger, sensing a scramble would better serve. His courage was amply rewarded. 31 to 27, the final score, and the Admirals remained in the hunt. It took a great effort by Amsterdam's offense to uh, come back and win the football game at the end of the game on a, on a great run by their quarterback. Uh, it was a 40-yard scramble, and, and that was the touchdown that clinched the game. As the game went, it just seemed like, at one point, it almost seemed like the team that had the ball last was going to win. But this was when Jimmy Ballard came in and, and really established himself and put, put on one of the better performances that have ever been in the World League. 15,461 fans turned out to see the final home game against the London Monarchs. Jim Ballard got his first start at quarterback following his superb performance against the Admirals. The fans were hoping to see the London Monarchs sliced up by Ballard and his troops. London head coach Lionel Taylor had turned around the Monarchs' fortunes, and they still had a faint glimmer of a chance for a World Bowl spot. The Claymores won the toss, kicked off, and London marched 75 yards to the Claymores' four. Jones passes, touchdown, Willie Hinchcliffe, four yards. Hinchcliffe beat four, he duck it. An early lead for London, and the Claymores couldn't come up with a touchdown in reply. But Paul McCallum was sent in to attempt a 51-yard field goal worth four points. McCallum certainly got the distance. He's, He's got it. Who's that thing? And that's good for four. What a kick. Paul McCallum's cool execution made the kicker a tremendous asset for the Claymores. In the second quarter, Jim Ballard confidently marshaled his troops on a 46-yard drive down to London's 35. But Ballard is doing a pretty decent job, finds the outlet man, Ron Dickerson, who's got a lot of running room, well, could be gone, only stud still to beat, and is he in his touchdown? What a play from Dickerson. Stud still had the angle, but Dickerson just too fast and too strong. That's just a great effort. Once again, watch the protection, watch the big boys in blue up front. Hits the end of a drop, doesn't see what he wants downfield, and a slip right there. And Dickerson does a great job of going into the end zone, pulling Mark Montroy, excuse me, Darren Studstill, 27, into the end zone. The Claymores missed a two-point conversion attempt, but still led 10-7. to seven. Two possessions later, Jim Ballard surveyed the London end zone from the Monarchs' 12. Third down for the newly married Jim Ballard. Touchdown, Yo Murphy! They run the double slant routes. You're going to see Cooper 81 come inside, and then Murphy's going to follow him. That gives a dilemma now to the safety. You see, they're not sure. Stud still didn't really know who to go to. As a result, they throw it to the second man in, Yo Murphy, for the score. And they're messing around with two-point conversions here. Gavin Hastings attempts the extra point. That one is good. And the London Monarchs are in trouble. Two London touchdowns to a touchdown and a field goal for Scotland in the second half made the score 27 to 21. Sir Ann Stacey decided it was time to go to work. Stacey. Oh, met. oh. Great oh. second effort and gone. Put that one in the book. Touchdown to Scotland. He just exploded. Another great move. The Pro Scouts will count how many yards a guy makes after he's touched. He's touched once, 
He's touched twice. And the rest, he just blows people away. Sean Crocker can't get to him. The extra point is missed by Gavin Hastings. Power, speed, and magic. And Saran Stacy gave the Claymores full control with a 12-point lead. The Monarchs got one back to make it respectable when Mike Titley broke the end zone plane on a two-yard touchdown catch from Jones. But one touchdown does not a comeback make. And after recovering the onside kick, the Claymores celebrated their first home win over the old enemy, 33-28. Jim Ballard revitalizing the offense. Waited all year to get my chance. And, you know, last week I got my opportunity. And you know what they say, when you, make your, when you get your opportunity, you got to make the most of it. It's good to... Once again, to kick some English butt. <laughs> Love y'all, Scott. Love all y'all. At the press conference, Jim Kreiner's war cry echoed through Murray Field for the fifth time that season. All right, how about Jim Claymore? Yeah. Week 10, the final regular season game against the Dragons in Barcelona. The Claymore's priority was to stay healthy ahead of the World Bowl, and in an ugly but high-scoring game, they came off the worst, losing 32-27. to But there was one blazing ray of sunshine. Second down and 20. And Ballard moves up nicely to avoid the rush. He's looking deep downfield. Oh, nice catch. Cooper and Beautiful a touchdown catch. by Scott Cooper. A na was... national player from Strathclyde University. And a legitimate Einstein type individual. Yes, going for his PhD, writing his thesis. That's a NFL catch right there. Watch Ballard step up to avoid the rush. He stepped now. He knows where he wants to be. Nice job by Wagner on the outside. Throws the ball. Now watch him go up and get this ball. In between coverage. And they have two defenders back there. Jim Ballard's precision passing made him an exciting prospect in the upcoming World Bowl. Frankfurt Galaxy beat the Admirals to claim the second World Bowl spot, and the following week, the world's sporting media descended on Murray Field in eager anticipation. The league president looked forward to the big day. There's a lot of organizational elements involved, <clears throat> particularly because of the backfields party. And we've got a 130-piece marching band the university, from the University of Maryland, which is coming in today uh, to perform. We've got uh, Gunn and the Tartan Amoebas. We've, uh, we're expecting a, a large crowd, the biggest crowd we've ever had for American football. So to, to make that all happen, it's, it's been a lot of work, a lot of people working very, very hard hours, not only internally, but also externally. The SRU has worked hard in supporting this the event. The city of Edinburgh and the council has worked uh, very hard helping us out on certain things so it's it's nice to see it all come together for, for a great game on, on Sunday. We could well have 40,000 plus fans here to watch this game and uh, and I think it's and, and the fact that we're going to be going back to the United States and we're going to be going to 129 countries worldwide uh, you know there there may be as many as 200 million people watching this game and to see 40,000 Scots uh, you know cheering on the Claymores I think is going to be you know a great great day for all of us. World Bowl Sunday June 23rd a gorgeous afternoon. Almost 40,000 people turned out for a monster four-hour pregame party. A fantastic family atmosphere prevailed. Claymore's fans mingled with the visiting Frankfurt support in happy anticipation of the match. The University of Maryland marching band added a genuine touch of Americana, but the Claymore's faced Frankfurt without some of their most outstanding players. The league's most valuable man on defense, Ty Parton, Herman Carroll, Jared Cuyahalo, national player Robert Flickinger, and wideout Lee Gissendainer, these five had made crucial contributions but would miss the big game. Scottish Claymores versus Frankfurt Galaxy for World Bowl 96. After four hours of partying, the fans were all fired up for their football action, and they roared their approval as the Claymores took the field. Gavin Hastings got things underway, kicking off to the Galaxy. Mario Bailey fields at about his eight. Gets past the first guy, still on his feet. And Bailey, loose ball, fumble on the opening kickoff, and it's going in for a Scottish touchdown. What a start. And it's Marcus Thomas. Now here's the play here. I want you to watch Bailey fighting for extra yards, and this is when you're always susceptible to losing the ball. Right there, George Coghill with the rape on the right side. He brought his right arm down, and you talk about lucky bounces. And the extra point good from Gavin Hastings. And with 11 seconds gone of World Bowl 96, the Claymores are 7-0 up. The fastest touchdown in World League history and a bad start for Frankfurt. We pick it up on Galaxy's opening drive. 
So the Galaxy close to midfield. Trying to put away that disastrous start. In goes Simon, runs up the middle, has some room there, and will pick up eight or nine yards. <laughs> Yards for Cybert. If Frankfurt get a running game going here, it'll be very interesting. They're the worst in the league with the run. Bobby Phillips now has the ball and doesn't get a foul. Will be very close to first down yardage. Mark Sander coming round with help from Arnold Allay. Their second leading rusher with 49 attempts or 149 yards. You got a serious problem because he may be your best back. Average of 65 yards. The keeper from Pelour. He only had to get. About six inches at most. And I'll be very surprised if he hasn't made it, but we'll have to wait for the official adjudication. And he's working a first down at the Claymore's 40. They fake and they throw, and they've got Gary Harrell, who is pushed out of bounds by Forey Duckett, but that's going to be another first down. The drive starting at Frankfurt's own 20. They're at Scotland's 21 on the ground. And good for about five yards. Frankfurt can get a run going. That will be a big, big factor in this game. And they have been running it. They do the reverse to Jay Kearney. Kearney with blockers, with a lot of blockers. Could go. Touchdown, Frankfurt. What a response. <laughs> Did you see who threw the block? The key block, Steve Pelour, the fans fight over the ball there. The quarterback makes a great block on the reverse. Watch 16 Pelour. Look at this. Good block. Boy, you're going to get big points back home for that one. <laughs> and David Webb, no, that's one he's not going to want to look at on the film tomorrow. Jay Kearney coolly doing the damage for Frankfurt, and Ralph Kleinman made it seven with his extra point. More damage for the Claymores on the next drive when Don Reynolds slipped his blockers and sacked Jim Ballard. And it looked like disaster for the Claymores when the World League's most valuable offensive player, Sean LaChapelle, suffered a groin strain when he was running a pass route. LaChapelle had to leave the game, and that meant that Yo Murphy had to step up and fill his shoes. The Claymores had to punt from inside their own end zone. Paul McCallum, and they came after him. Oh, and he McCallum went down. Only just got it away. And Gary Harrell fields at the Scotland 38, and is down all the way to the 30-yard line. With great field position, Galaxy quarterback Steve Pelour took time before the snap and scanned the end zone from the Claymores 31. Time looking for Mario Bailey, got it, and coughed it up. Now, are they going to say had it? No, incomplete. Excellent job from Duckett, brings up third set. Pelour, shotgun. Four wide receivers out. Pelour gets hit by Gerald Jeffco, gets it off, and it's caught by Gary Harrell. The ball was tipped up in the air by David Wilson. He couldn't hang on. Harrell could to the one. What a play. Watch the hit that Pelour takes from 99 jump code. He breaks the double team. And this here is just football, folks. David Wilson has got to catch the ball. First and goal. They give to Bobby Phillips, who's met and hit. John DeWitt, the first man there. Joe O'Brien was there, too. So, too, was Emmett Waldron. Well, the Scottish defense will be happy to get out of this with a field goal again. Stay on the ground. Bobby Phillips can't get anywhere. Mark Sander draped all over it. Duckett came up and helped. It's out of the shotgun. Harold in motion. Pelour looks, has a man. Touchdown. Oh, what a first. catch. What a catch. Mario Bailey. Lineman with a much longer extra point. No problem at all. And with 10 21 remaining in the first half. World Bowl 96, the Frankfurt Galaxy have overcome a wretched start to take a 14-7 lead over the Scottish Claymores, courtesy of Mario Bailey. The extra point was good, and Super Mario showed how he earned his nickname. On the Claymores' next drive, they turned to Grandmaster running back Saran Stacey, but Galaxy linebacker Ronnie Woolfork stripped the ball, and his fellow linebacker Tom Cavallo came up with it at the bottom of the dog pile. When Steve Pelour tried to shoot his way out, defensive end Brian Proby got in behind enemy lines and sacked him on his own one-yard line. Galaxy had to punt. Fiery punts from his own end zone. Marcus Thomas fields at uh -oh. midfield and is trouble. Fumbled the ball. Lucky for Thomas. Somebody was there to recover. It's David Wilson. And Wilson's still on his feet to the 40. 
and stays on his feet all the way to the 38-yard line. First down from the 39 of their opponents for Scotland. Ballard goes upstairs, has a man, and he's got it all the way down inside the five to the one. Yo Murphy thinks he got a touchdown, but he's down at the one. Huge play for Scotland. He said Yo Murphy was going to have to step up. He just runs right by. Chris Hall, 32. And Dixon is late coming over from the safety position. Receiver. That's a great throw and a receiver. good catch. First and goal. Motion. They give. And no, they're doing the whistles and flags. Yeah. They're going to have to do this one again. Surround Stacey didn't get in anyway. Murphy goes wide left. Cooper wide right. Dickerson and Stacey in the backfield. Tate, the tight end. Ballard drops the pass, looks in the direction of Yo Murphy, got him, touchdown Scotland! <laughs> Gonna get a better look at it here. Three steps, that ball is out of there. 32 Hall, he sees it right now. He overruns it a tad. Gavin Hastings has to make this extra point. This game's going to be a close one, Ooh. and he hasn't. Ooh. Great pressure. So the Claymores trailed by a point 14 to 13. After a season of solid play, it was suddenly clear that Yo Murphy didn't have to stand in anybody's shadow. We pick it up on the restart kickoff. Mike Bellamy fields at the eight-yard line. Less than a minute running. He's caught the ball up. Loose ball, and it's still loose. And Sean Jones has got it for Scotland. something of everything in this game. <laughs> Bellamy, he's just running along. It looks as though he just loses the ball. See how long he takes to tuck it away? But if you look at Bellamy's wrist, he's got his wrist tight, taped up pretty tight. Ballard on first down gets really tight the tight end. Tate probably got back to the original line of scrimmage and then ended up about nine yards further back. Franklin are not going to give up much. Ballard has his batted up in the air. Oh, boy. And that does stop the clock with 13 seconds remaining. Ballard on third down and long. Pressure comes from Kerr. Ballard looks for Murphy. Has he got it? Oh. Yes! Oh, what a catch! What a catch. Oh. Oh. That was unbelievable. We said, Yo Murphy has to step up with La Chapelle injured. You can't do more than this. He goes to the old post corner. Chris Hall sees it. And he makes him do what he has to do, float that ball out there. But that's an amazing catch. Incredible. And you know what? If we let it roll, I think he got two feet in. In the NFL, he's going to get credit for two feet in. I think he dots the eye and gets them both in. In this league, you only got to have one foot in. Yeah, Jimmy, they, they, he made you look good on that one. This for two. Looks, has a lot of time now, gets the pressure, just has to get rid of it. Coach Kreiner couldn't help but be disappointed that the two-point conversion was missed, but Young Murphy's astounding one-handed grasp in the end zone ensured a halftime lead for Scotland. Both teams traded punts at the start of the third quarter, but the Claymores were the first to add to their scoreboard tally. Paul McCallum coolly split the uprights from 46 yards, and that made it 22-14 Scotland. Galaxy trailed by eight and were anxious lest the Claymores should pull ahead out of sight. A lot of checking at the line. Below drops, gets excellent protection again, goes for Mario Bailey. Got him, has he? They've ruled it a touchdown, and Bailey's done it again. Super Mario put on the speed, and the James gang found themselves one step behind. Steve Pelour went for two, but threw incomplete, and the Claymores led by two, 22 to 20. With the game finally balanced, we pick it up on the Claymores' first play after the restart kick. Nervous times for both these teams. Ballard goes upstairs, has a man, has a first down, and more for Yo Murphy. He's, he's going to score. What a throw. It's wrong. It's another touchdown for Yo Murphy. And we talked about Scotland hitting back quick, quickly, and they've done it. That was an unbelievable throw. You're going to see it again. 
Again, that ball's in the air a long time. Doggett's looking at it. Doggett looked as though he was going to knock the ball out. And you're not going to catch Yo. Now, oh, Sid Hastings can kick an extra point here. It's a nine-point lead, and that really would be significant. Frankfurt would have to score twice. But he missed the last one. Oh. He's missed that one as well. Gavin Hastings has picked the worst possible day to have a stinker. It just wasn't Gavin's day. And after Frankfurt were forced to punt in the fourth quarter, the Galaxy D keyed on Saran Stacey, forcing another fumble. The purple and orange came up with the pigskin. Third down and a bunch for Pelour. And it's picked off! And it's James Fuller. He should try to score with this. Fuller still on his feet. Gary Harrell brings him down. The offense couldn't move it, but Paul McCallum thought he'd have a try. He did one. Has another on its way. Got the, the distance. And oh. good. He's done it again. Another four-point field goal from 50 yards for Paul McCallum, and the Claymores could feel their grip tightening on their first world title. But Frankfurt weren't finished just yet. Four minutes left. Pelour upstairs again has Gary Harrell who steps out of bounds ahead of David Wilson down to the 38 yard line stops the clock 3.53 left low snap Pelour handles it well gets it off has Mike Bellamy who rolls out of bounds three and a half minutes remaining Frankfurt and the Claymore has got a problem on the defense they're not sure they got people running on the field the last minute. Pelour goes, has a man, and that's because of the confusion. Pelour with another completion. And they realize they got plenty of time. Plus, they got a two-minute warning. They'll stop the clock. Pelour has another man again. Jay Kearney gets himself out of bounds ahead of Forey Duckett inside three minutes remaining. Uh, that, that, that's face Flags. mask. They're going to get him for the face mask, if not the personal foul for going around his head. 2.54 left. Frankfurt knocking on the door. Pelour from the shotgun. Lots of time. Goes over the middle. Oh. Got a man. Oh. Touchdown Frankfurt. Mike Bellamy. This one is not over. You cannot give a quarterback like Steve Pelour that much time to throw the football. A textbook touchdown pass from Steve Pelour as Frankfurt showed the form that made them World League champs in 95. It all set up a thrilling finale. Turning to Saran Stacy, the Claymores tried to keep possession and run out the clock. But on third down, Yo Murphy couldn't hang on, and the Claymores decided to punt it to Galaxy. That gave the Germans one more chance, and the Claymores had to rely on their D to hold the line. The season comes down to this one final drive for the Scottish Claymores and the Frankfurt Galaxy. Shotgun and four wide receivers in for Frankfurt. Harrell in motion. Pelour has time. Goes to the sideline, has a man. He Mario got, oh, no, he didn't get out. The clock's on. Out James Williams with an excellent tackle. Remember, a field goal, no good. They have to get six. Time again for Pelour. Got a man over the middle. Doesn't want to be there. Right in the middle. Can't stop the clock. Mario Bailey again. A minute 13. It's still running. Second and four. Pelour shotgun again. The four wide out staying in. He's overthrown everybody. Looking in the vicinity of Mario Bailey, James Williams in coverage. Third and eight, Harrell, the motion man. Pelour from the shotgun. With time again, has Harrell. They got Harrell hit by Fuller and Williams. Oh, no, he didn't get out of bounds. He did not get out of bounds. Did he get the first down? Short of the first down as well. Fourth down oh. and a yard. Clock still running. They can't just spike it. It's fourth they, down they and one. They got two choices, quick outs, or they got to run it. 34 seconds. What's the bad snap? Smart play. They've got a first down, but they can't stop the clock. I think that was a planned play, and the refs are going to talk about it. Oh. Ingo Cyber oh. keeping his head. Oh, wait a minute. I don't know if that was a pick. Well, the clock is down to 19 seconds, the game clock. But another call. Yeah, the fourth down fumble. That's a fourth down fumble. Fourth the, down. the ball. And that a means fumble it's all on, over. Here's the rule, Nick. A fumble on fourth down, the ball cannot be advanced by anybody else. By the person who didn't touch it first. The person who touched it first was Steve Pelour. Even a controversial note at the end of the game could take nothing away from the Claymore's achievement. A world champion bucket dunk for Coach Kreiner for leading his team from worst to first in just one season.
The atmosphere was ecstatic. The final score, 32 to 27 in favor of Scotland. Ernie Staudner could walk proud. His Galaxy came close to retaining their title, and the Claymores ascended the victory platform. Head coach Tim Kreiner, you have brought the World Bowl to Edinburgh. You are the 1996 World. With unceasing hard work and determination, the Scottish Claymores achieved what had seemed impossible only a year before, going from worst to first in a single season. The fans fully understood the magnitude of what they'd just witnessed, and it was especially sweet for special teams captain Ben Torriero. It was something that, you know, I wouldn't have traded places with anybody to be there. You know, I was the special teams captain in the 1996 World Bowl Berth clinching Claymores. And we were going to be champions that day, and that there was just nothing going to take us. There was something that said, you know, the old lottery finger came down from the sky and said, "It is you," you know. And and we were going to be it this year. There were times when we threw things away. There was times when we pulled it back again. But I think everybody believed had such a strong belief in themselves in the Claymores. Not only themselves, but they had a strong belief in the man standing next to them. And I think that really is what pulled the Claymores through this year. Well, I think that was, it was all the work that everybody in the organization put in. I was happiest for everybody in the organization who may not have ever been in a, in a situation to, uh, you know, to feel what it's like to win a championship. And uh, even more so, I was really delighted for Jim and for the players who are coming back to the Claymores from 1995, the Sir Ann Stacys and the George Coggles and the Mark Sanders and, and all those guys who really suffered through a really tough year for them. And to be able to have that kind of turnaround and to, and to see it in their eyes and the, and the enjoyment and the fun and the excitement that they had was, was a reward enough for me. I, I would look for us to be a much better football team next year and, and as a result of this uh, I think you can expect uh, not only in the press corps but but also hopefully at the end of each and every season the cry and the rally how about them claymores you know should be a prominent fixture around here